Last lecture, we were concerned with the internal building blocks as we introduced crystallography within this new field to us of mineralogy. Today, we're also going through intro to crystallography, but instead now thinking more about the specifics of crystal nucleation and growth. There won't be very many pictures in today's lecture, but we will do some drawings. Let's just start with one picture to illustrate crystal nucleation and growth, which is a slice through a beautiful tourmaline crystal. And as we see this slice, we can see that there is indeed, like tree rings, a part of the youthful crystal, which then grows away towards the exterior in, as tree rings. That is the process illustrated in a beautiful specimen of nucleation and growth. So as we go through this, let's put together the crystallization sequence. We'll go, um, let's go like this. We'll go A, here's our sequence for building a beautiful crystal. And the first thing we must start with is atoms and molecules that are existing dissolved in some fluid. It could be water, it could be magma, it could even be air if the crystals are forming at a volcanic fumarole. So what we'll do is we'll draw our, in this case, let's just have it be water. And here is our beaker. Our beaker has, there's our liquid in it. And inside of it, what did we say we had here? Let's just say we have atoms and we have molecules existing in a fluid. If you want to write down some of those different geologic fluid, you can right here. And importantly, these molecules or atoms Maybe this is sodium and chloride, for example, that will come together to make salt. They are moving randomly throughout this fluid. So molecules exist in a fluid, and they move randomly. Maybe diffuse would be a good word for how they're um, moving as well. So as they're moving randomly throughout, they're going to therefore be able to collide together and also moving apart. Okay? That's what I want you to be visualizing. So sometimes when they collide together, you can get a situation where more come to bonding, I guess, could occur. And we call that clustering. All right, so let's have a situation here where two come together and we form a cluster. Now this starts to come back to a concept from thermodynamics and chemistry called Gibbs free energy. And I don't know if you're, so let's just say here, let's say recall Gibbs free energy. What do we give that symbol in chemistry? It's delta G. And the fact of Gibbs free energy is that all spontaneous processes in nature act to reduce Gibbs free energy. All spontaneous processes move to negative delta G. That means if a crystal is going to form in nature, we must be moving to minus delta G through that process as well. And clustering is the process that's going to allow that. So let's go number three here. We're going to say that small clusters have very many unsatisfied bonds. Right? So if you can imagine, here's our two little clusters. I'll make, I can make them a little bigger here. Well, there are all these bonds on the outside that are unsatisfied. That does not have a Gibbs free energy that's favorable towards more crystallization. And instead, what should happen there is that that cluster will move apart or dissolve. So small clusters are energetically unstable. Let's say that, let's say energetically unstable, and that will make them dissolve. Why are they un stable, it's all those unsatisfied bonds. But if you can add more by random happenstance and collisions, clusters together, or, or sorry, molecules together into that cluster, you start to satisfy some of those bonds. So we're going to say here is that bigger clusters become, let's see, sorry, become more stable as the real principle here is um, surface area. We want to reduce the surface area to volume. As surface area, that's where all those unsatisfied bonds are, surface area diminishes 
relative, relative, spell that correctly, to volume. This is a big principle right here. So, okay, what do we need to say next? So we've got bigger clusters start to form. Well, at some point, can we call one of these bigger clusters a nucleus? Absolutely. We can call it a nucleus. Let's say this, nucleus of our crystal forms when the cluster is stable. Nucleus forms when cluster is stable. It's had enough bond satisfied that it has a negative delta G. And this is our first big event. We can put a star here and we say nucleation has occurred. Next, we need to have growth occur. Well, growth is actually a lot simpler because growth just requires material moving to the already established nucleus. So let's just say five, growth. Sometimes in science, we use the word advection. Advection just means movement. So growth occurs when nutrient molecules approach stable cluster. Well, of course, we could call that stable cluster the nucleus. Um, I use that word nutrient. That, that doesn't really mean anything specific here. It just means material that's actually in the crystal formula. So a nutrient might be sodium for salt, which is sodium chloride, or it might just be uh, sulfur for sulfur. Okay, just something that belongs in the crystal lattice. So this balance that we have, uh, what are we talking about balance here? Well, it's this thermodynamic balance of Gibbs free energy and just energy in general. It means we need to be thinking about all the different types of energy. So let's, uh, I guess I haven't said that perfectly well here, but let's just say this. Let's, let's just consider all the energy, all the energy. So we have Gibbs free energy, of course, but there's other kinds of energy too, right? There are bonds that are unsatisfied or satisfied. There is temperature of the water. There could be someone stirring the water, which means we have kinetic energy. Um, those are the big type of energies that we have to overcome or work with in order to allow for nucleation and growth to occur. All right, so there's our first illustration. Now let's move on to our second. This is maybe the most science that we're going to do today. This is our first graph of the semester. We're done with this graph. We're done with class today. So the y-axis here is going to be a rate, and it's going to be our nucleation rate. So how many crystals form? And I also want to draw on the same axis. I want to draw growth rate. Growth rate I'm going to do growth in a different color just so we can separate them out. Growth rate. Okay. And our x-axis in this graph is going to be a measure of supersaturation. I expect you have experience with supersaturation. This is our drive to crystallize, right? When something is very supersaturated in Na and Cl, you're going to crystallize salt. When it's low, you're not going to grow it as much or as fast. So down here, we're going to have very low degrees of supersaturation, and here, very high degrees of supersaturation. So, and then here, we're going to put growth rate and nucleation rate. How fast does a crystal grow with respect to supersaturation, and how fast does it nucleate? And they occur in different places. The reason for that, that you probably have experience with, is time, right? When there is a High degree of supersaturation, are we going to have a lot of time or a little bit of time? Well, we're going to have less time, right? We're going to have less time to do something. And when you are very low supersaturated, well, you have more time. The drive is not as extreme, so you're going to have more time to make things happen. So way, the way that crystallization works with respect to supersaturation and nucleation is that at low degrees of supersaturation, not many crystal clusters form just kind of small amounts. But as the degree of supersaturation increases, nucleation rate 
increases. Why? Well, lots and lots of more collisions are occurring. The clusters are forming. Those clusters are the nuclei. Okay, so we have very high degrees, and then we're going to come back down. Because at really high degrees of supersaturation, there's not even enough time to grow any crystal or to, to form any crystals. Now, growth has a very similar behavior, but the curve looks somewhat different. Growth is favored at lower degrees of supersaturation, and then we come, and then as you go to higher degrees of supersaturation, you actually don't have time. So this is our growth curve, and this is our find when you interpret a rock sample. If you have a rock with a bunch of tiny little crystals, those crystals haven't had time to grow at all. They are nucle It's a nucleation dominated system. And so what you could then infer, if they are very fine grained, then we should expect there to be high degrees. This equals that the system was very, very highly saturated. Alternatively, if you find a sample that has huge crystals, big old gemmy things that would be fantastic for a museum or your personal mineral collection, well, this coarse grain texture, you know something about the thermodynamics of that system because growth is favored by low degrees of supersaturation, low saturation. And because there's such low saturation, that means there's a lot of time. And it's that time that allows for big crystals to grow. So this is the significance of this graph. Think on it, and we can talk about it maybe sometime in person.